hey guys in this video the lovely team is going to be talking about institutionalization for your a-level psychology now there are lots of studies and bits you need to remember in here so to help you with that over on my website there are loads of multiple choice questions just waiting for you seen how Bowlby's maternal deprivation hypothesis had provided at least a working theory for how the deprivation of maternal attachment, that is attachment to a single usually biological mother as a primary caregiver, could have a profound implication. And this implication would be on the later life of the infant, both through their childhood and their teenage years and then into their later development as an adult. But there was a major flaw in this hypothesis and that flaw was the use of the word deprivation. Bowlby used this as a single term to describe a very wide range of occurrences, which could be bereavement, the death of a mother, the removal of the mother from the infant, the removal of the infant from the mother, perhaps by the state to be taken into care, or the failure of the infant to form any kind of attachment with the mother, which is rare but does occasionally happen. So since Bowlby put forward this hypothesis, deprivation has been split into two distinct forms in recent years. These are privation and deprivation. Privation can be defined as this, where a child has never had an attachment to either a mother or a significant caregiver. So that attachment has just never materialised, and that can happen for a variety of reasons, as we'll see. Deprivation is slightly different. That is, where a child has had an attachment to a mother or caregiver, but this attachment has since been broken. So deprivation is when in the past there's been an attachment between a child and their primary caregiver, but since that attachment has been formed, something has broken it. In reality, these terms are very close together. While they do mean different things, they're not completely distinct and you can't separate them completely. They overlap and it can be difficult to discriminate between the two. We'll use a case study to take a deeper look at privation. This is a very extreme case study, which some people may find distressing, but it's also the best illustration of privation, and it was provided in 1977 by Curtis. Quite often it's known as the case of Jeannie. Jeannie was an unidentified as yet young girl who was subjected, sadly, to sustained and repeated extreme cruelty by her biological parents. To take a few examples, she was forcibly strapped to a high chair, she was beaten for making noise, and for the entirety of her childhood, she was completely denied any access to basic toys and games. Jeannie also had, because of her isolation and the strong desire of her parents for her not to be found because of the repercussions for them, she had no opportunity at all to play with other children. Another important factor, playing with other children is an important part of a child's development and how they learn to make normal social and emotional connections. Fortunately, Jeannie was discovered by the authorities when she was 13. She was, as you may expect, physically very underdeveloped, with atrophied muscles, very limited growth, and very malfunctioning motor skills. She had very limited use of her limbs and couldn't make fine movements at all. Critically, Jeannie was also unable to communicate. The best she could do was make basic and completely incoherent animal noises, growls and snarls and yelps. Fortunately, after long and sustained high-quality care, Jeannie was able to use some language, at least to a basic degree, to communicate her needs to those around her. Unfortunately, her social and intellectual skills and abilities never fully developed as they would have expected to. The privation had been too much for too long. Disturbing though the case of Jeannie is and was then, it shows the horrifying and sustained effects of this privation, and in particular the effect it can have on the motor and language skills of a child. It also shows us why privation must be avoided at all costs. A second example are the Romanian orphanage studies. To understand this, however, we need a little bit of background. In the early 1990s, from 1990 to about 1993, the repressive and brutal communist regimes across Eastern Europe fell. And an example of this was in Romania, where the communist re regime fell very swiftly. Before this, Romania had effectively been a closed country where very little media or attention from the West was allowed. This previously closed country began to open up to the world and allow the media in. Large numbers of Romanian children were in overcrowded orphanages. In these orphanages, their very basic physical needs were at least adequately met. They were adequately clothed, they were reasonably fed, their basic physical needs were looked after, and the hygiene was okay. Unfortunately, however, their physical needs being met meant that their emotional needs had not been met. 
they had received no sensitive care or any real opportunity to form attachment with the people looking after them. The people looking after them changed regularly and there would be many at one time. They had no ability or opportunity to form a sole good attachment with one of them. This was therefore a perfect but extremely unfortunate example of privation. An orphanage is an example of an institution. It's an organisation which cares for children, but not one where their biological parents are present. There are many staff who will all together look after the children, which presents some opportunities, but also many difficulties for the infants. Following this opening up of Romania in the 1990s, many psychologists conducted research in these orphanages to try and help the children, but also to better understand the consequences, both in the short term and long term, of this privation. One example of these Romanian orphanage studies was done in 2007 by a group of researchers led by Rutter. Rutter studied 111 Romanian orphans. All of them had been adopted since 1991 by British families. They were compared with a smaller control group, a group to determine a baseline or a normal. And this control group was a group of 52 British children who had also been adopted. So although the process had been the same, there was different cultures and different countries. And the object was to determine how Romanian institutionalization had affected the children. That was really the only difference between the two groups. These children were followed and monitored, at least from a distance, over a prolonged period of several years from their adoption. Each of the children had been adopted at around six months old. Some were younger and some were older, but all of the children critically had spent this critical period of birth to three years old in an orphanage. The children were then assessed, first at age four, then again at six, and then again at 11. The children who'd been adopted at younger than six months old developed in much the same way as the control group, both intellectually, socially, and physically. They developed entirely normally along entirely normal lines. The children who had been adopted at older than six months showed signs of emotional and social problems. And the control group children, and remember the control group was a group of British children who had been in care but had been adopted, didn't show these problems. They all developed normally. It was possible to gain several conclusions from this research. The first was that the effects of privation can be reversed if attachment starts to form before six months old. That six months effectively represents a grace period during which the effects of privation can be reversed, but only if an infant starts in that six months to form an attachment. A second conclusion was that the long-term effects are more permanent, they're more set in stone and irreversible if the attachment doesn't form before six months old. They may still be reversible, but it will be more difficult. It will require higher quality, more consistent care for longer for that to happen. Rutter was able also to come to a third conclusion, that maternal deprivation did not cause problems in and of itself. The control group of 52 British children had also been adopted, but they showed no signs at all of mental problems, physical problems or social problems. It wasn't the maternal deprivation and being adopted that had caused it in the Romanian children. One thing to note is this is something we call a longitudinal study. It was done over a vast amount of time, in this case, many, many years. Therefore, the results provide a very high level of insight into long-term effects, something which can't be done if you have a very short-term study of individual events, days or months. Random one-off variables can also be discounted. A single random event isn't going to have a huge impact and affect the results, making the overall conclusions more valid and reliable. The children were observed in the real world. The study therefore had high levels of ecological validity, making it more likely that we can generalise the results at least to an extent and make them apply to more and wider groups of children. One thing to note and one disadvantage of this method is that all of the data and information gained was completely qualitative. There was no numerical quantitative data. Because it contained no numerical information, this makes it a lot harder to form generalised conclusions. We can't mathematically or numerically form laws or theories as to cause and effect, because all of the data was qualitative rather than quantitative. Prior to the research done by Rutter in 2007, Hodges and Tizard in 1989 did another longitudinal study, a study done over a very long period of time, in this particular case at regular intervals as we'll see. For this research, a total of 65 children were studied. Each of them had been placed in a residential nursery when they were four months old. A residential nursery is another example of an institution. It's an organisation which cares for children but without their parents present. Effectively, in this case, the institution had replaced the normal parent relationship. 
These 65 children had all entered the nursery during that critical period. They were all less than six months old, and therefore they hadn't had the chance to form any kind of secure attachment to a caregiver, especially a primary caregiver like a mother. They'd all been taken into care in the institution before that could occur. By the time they had reached four years old, all of these 65 children fell into one of three clearly defined categories. Category one was children who had returned to their biological mothers. They had gone back into a normal family lifestyle. The second category was those that had been adopted. They'd been taken into a new family. And the third category was some that had unfortunately not been adopted and had remained for a long period of time in that nursery. By the time that the children were 16 years old, their relationships had developed and some analysis could be done to see how they interacted with others. The children from the adopted group had relatively normal family relationships. They had formed roughly normal attachments with their immediate family around them after being adopted. Unfortunately, their peer relationships with people their own age and their social interaction with people their own age was less good and less normal. The other two groups, however, that is those who remained in the nursery for a long period of time, or those who were returned to their biological mothers, showed less normal peer and family relationships. They had less secure and normal attachments than the group who had been adopted. There were several conclusions that could be drawn from this piece of research. The main one was that children who have experienced care in an institution are indeed able to recover and form at least to a roughly normal extent normal family relationships with adoptive parents. Those relationships won't be perfect. No child's relationship with its parent is perfect, but they will at least be roughly normal, and we can say they perhaps conform to rough social norms. A second conclusion, however, was that this requires a loving, nurturing, high-quality environment, and this environment needs to meet both the physical needs of the child and the emotional needs of the child. By physical needs, we mean straightforward things. Food, clothing, shelter, all of the basic physical things needed to nurture development. The emotional needs are attention and love, the normal emotional things a child needs to grow up in a healthy way. This was a natural exper experiment. It was done with the children in their natural habitat. It wasn't done under laboratory conditions, and it was also done over a very long period of time. Because of this, the ecological validity, the real-world application of this research, is high. It has application in the real world. It's not limited to a laboratory setting. The sample size, however, was relatively small. By the time it got to 16 years old for the children, some of them couldn't be found by the researchers, which is perhaps expected. This drops the sample size down from 65 to about 49, so a very small sample size. Because of this, you can't take these results and generalise them to all children everywhere based off such a small sample. There is, unfortunately, an obvious ethical issue with this study. Children at four months or four years old are unable to give any kind of informed consent to the process. They do not know why they're being observed and they're unable to understand the process. At 16, however, they are better able to give informed consent and this ethical issue is lessened once the children get older. One problem with this piece of research is that it took no account of other outside factors when coming to conclusions. These might be poverty, if the children varied in their level of poverty, how poor they were. It might be undernourishment if they varied in diet, or it could even be geographical area. There may be differences between where the children came from. As we've seen in this video, there have been a great many studies done to try and determine the long-term effects on children of being in an institution. Many of these studies, although each study was different, used different methods, gained different conclusions and had different problems, identified similar long-term effects. And there are five main long-term effects of institutionalization. The first of these is called affectionless psychopathy, something we've already seen a little bit. This is a complete inability to understand or comprehend how your actions might impact those around you. It simply doesn't add up. You don't understand that your actions might have an impact on other people. A second is called anaclytic depression. This depression can include a number of symptoms, such as a complete loss of appetite, recurrent and severe insomnia and inability to sleep, social interaction issues with how you talk and deal with others, and slow intellectual development, effectively learning difficulties. A third long-term effect of institutionalization is called deprivation dwarfism, physical underdevelopment, which is caused by emotional deprivation and leads to a child being much smaller and slighter than they would otherwise be. A fourth effect is delinquency, a larger chance of ending up involved in crimes and convicted of crimes. 
And a fifth unfortunate effect of institutionalization is a reduced intelligence, or at least a much slower rate of intellectual development.